I always I always wonder how those opening intros are going to go. I told her to make stuff up, so <laughs> um, most of that was a lie. So, uh, good morning, happy Thursday. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to share this with you all. Um, a little bit about this piece. This is um, a collection of insights I like to call of what we are seeing out in the world today, what I continue to look at each week, this gets updated each week, really just because of the amount of change that is happening, it is so frequent that it, uh, you know, it, I, I was looking at some of the slides last night, I'm like, that's already dated because it's a month old, you know, so this is a, a evolving, uh, insightful, uh, I'd say, portfolio of all the things, uh, work strategies that different companies are, are attempting to to uh, implement or have done and, and not have, that they maybe have not worked so well. But we're trying to understand what is the future because my crystal ball I left at home, so unfortunately I can't tell you the winning lottery ticket numbers or else I wouldn't be here. But um, this is trying to forecast and understand what is happening in our world and how can we certainly be ready for change because it, it's a company, as they say. So um, a couple of things, again, if you have questions, let me know. I'd, I'd love to, to understand more about uh, even from, from your point of view, what's happening with, with what you're doing and where you're working. And this piece overall, I'm happy to share if you're interested. Um, it does make for some good bedtime reading, so if you're having trouble sleeping, you can pull this up and slide six, is, uh, it'll put you away. But uh, reach out to POE if you're interested. We'll make sure they get an updated version of this, and then we can uh, do a copy. I'm also, this is my shameless plug. Uh, my, my boss asked me to, to do this. My team, we're a huge team of three people uh, that covers the entire continent. So we're, we're always trying to, to learn and, and listen and understand what's happening out in the world of work. And we recently deployed a very short pulse survey just to try, try to really understand what changes are happening and then the why behind it. Right. Is it what's driving that need or the what has worked, what hasn't worked? So the idea is to quickly capture some thoughts and ideas around what is happening. And then uh, as we get more data points, be able to then share that back. It is completely anonymous. We will not send you any coupons for new tires or anything like that. Um, but it is, uh, it is completely up to you. I will also have this up at the end if you want to participate. So moving into some different insights, really there is no way to fire up the flux capacitor and travel back in time to pre-pandemic workplaces uh, and, and return to work as, as maybe what was done back then. And some organizations may say we, we don't want to go back maybe to how things were being done in the past because maybe they weren't always just right for for that organization so it is interesting i do look at this each week you may have seen some of this castle access they each week release uh their their findings from the 10 10 largest cities in the u.s this is badge swipe data uh that they that they use and track to understand who's coming into the office week by week and so this is actually last week's data that came out on tuesday so it's interesting to watch the ebb and flow and in, in how these numbers change over time so um Usually, you know, summer is, is, is and, and we're entering into the fall time period where you'll start to see some of the numbers get a little bit higher. Uh, when there's inclement weather in certain parts of the country, you'll see those numbers drop because more people will start working from home. Vacations, holidays will impact the numbers, and so it's interesting to watch where that average. The average has been at 50% or above for several weeks this year but uh, typically has, has fallen below, but it's interesting to watch those numbers play out. No surprise. Sorry, Jeff. Yes. Just real quick, I think you are, you are at 50%. I think it costs a few to be there for us to come in for training all the time. 
Yeah, yeah. Yeah, Texas has been like, what pandemic? Like, what are you talking about, right? Like, rub some dirt on it and walk it off, right? So, um, so they, they've always been out there. Um, so it, it, yeah, it is interesting to kind of see. Chicago has had the largest growth, interesting enough, where they started the year at just around 34%, and they've already grown. You know, they've they've increased 20 percent on, on top of that. So it is interesting to see these these numbers. This is bad swipe data, so um, it, it can't tell you if someone showed up, swiped their badge, and went home. That's what I like to do. Um, <laughs> I have perfect attendance except for today, so shoot. But um, but they can't tell if you've been there five minutes, five hours, or whatnot. So it's take it for what it's worth. But it is at least a way to to understand what's happening in in some of our larger urban areas. Uh, McKinsey followed that up with an attempt to understand office attendance by both industry and and company size. And so you can see the different industries on the left-hand side. And then as you move to the right, you can start to see the, uh, the growth of that organization and then the number of days per week on average that is happening. So it's interesting, the larger you become, the less amount of time people want to spend in the workplace. So you know, the, that, that was an interesting aha uh -huh for me, is that there's lower attendance in larger firms are in our knowledge economy, so kind of interesting. Certain, certain industries obviously make it more difficult to work anywhere else, but the way, so I'm going back a little bit. Which leads us into this topic. Uh, this one's starting to get a little dated, but there's still, I'm still hearing rumblings about, hey, maybe we should go to a four day work week. That would be great. That would solve every problem in the world. No, it won't. But this, this was a uh, six month study that was done last year, mostly uh, with European companies. There were a few uh, North American companies that participated, but they wanted to understand if we went to a four day work week, 32 hours, not four tens. People are like, why? I don't know, I didn't create the survey. So 32 hours per week, they didn't reduce the pay of anyone. They just said, we'll pay you as is for 32 hours. And for the most part, companies chose Friday as the day of, of not working. Other companies allowed individuals to self-select and pick you know, which days that they wanted off. So they wanted to understand you know, what, how would this play out? How would this work? Uh, you know, what are the benefits? Of course, everyone is celebrating this and doing backflips. So the data, the, the early data that was released said that they found that there was an increase in work stress and burnout. So people were actually feeling a sense of balance and being able to have that extra day off allow them to balance both work and personal life. Some even said they actually were more satisfied and value their job more by having this as an, as an extra perk, which was kind of interesting. Employees saw an improvement in their overall emotional, mental, and physical well-being. So many chose that extra day off to uh, be more be more active, to to work on their their overall well-being. Some chose to uh, to volunteer or, or to to pick up uh, dust off that hobby that they never had time for. And so they found ways to sort of use that extra time to do something else that was enjoyable. Uh, some companies actually said work performance went up, and it wasn't necessarily because they they sped up or worked harder. It was really, I think, because they were more deliberate and more intentional with the time that they were spending. So if they only had those 32 hours, they were very decisive in what they were doing. So instead of calling that 60-minute meeting where you spend the first 20 minutes BSing about the Golden Bachelor, <laughs> you're really like, you know what, we're going to just do 30 minutes, we're in and out, get right back to work, right? If we want to talk about Golden Bachelor, we can do that too. And, um, the other interesting stat here, 70% after this was concluded said, if I were to move on to a new employer that required me to go back to a five day work week, 
you would need to pay me anywhere between 10 to 50% more in pay. So they were actually attaching a dollar amount to this perk. And so this seemed all great and, and fantastic. I dug into the study a little bit more to understand like, so who, who are the companies who are actually participating in, in, in doing this? And so what I found almost 80% who participated were of companies of 25 or less employees. So very, very small companies that I think could be very agile, very flexible, that I think could perhaps work well for a, a four day work week. Only two companies that had more than 101 employees. So small companies. And then 63% of those that participated were IT, telecom, or professional services. So it got me thinking about, aha, again, Here's where certain industries might work well to do a four-day work week, right? Others, maybe not so much. Healthcare, ah, I broke my arm. Sorry, it's Friday, see you on Tuesday. Because <laughs> Tuesday's the new Monday, right? So healthcare it could be a challenge, finance, manufacturing. Um, so there, there, there could be some challenges with everyone moving towards a four-day week. It's not to say that it's impossible or not, that we're never going to get there, but there's a lot of consensus, a lot of interest in, in this topic. And Forbes dug into it a little bit further and, and wanted to understand, is, are there preferences with, if there was a four day week, who would be uh, interested or, or would, would want to uh, take this on? And, and funny enough, it ended up being older generations had a higher preference. What's that? People who are already at retirement. Right, right. right. So yeah, here's your golden bachelors again. So here's, but it was interesting because you would have almost thought it would have been younger generations entering the workforce, but they actually want to be at work. They want to be connected. They want to build their brand and be mentored. And uh, you know, so it's 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 sort of hard to do that remotely. But interesting enough, as you age and become more seasoned in what you do, you become more confident, more more efficient with the work and therefore feel like you could work elsewhere if, if needed. So four day week we will wait and see. Is the four day week in office? Mostly in office, yes. So that was where they weren't really uh, playing with the hybrid approach. It was four in one out, yep, because they wanted to understand how that would look if you were actually in. And then, of course, yeah, there's such a wide variety of, of all the different uh, ideas there. Digital nomads, this is one that is, is interesting. It is really simply about individuals who self-select. They're, they're location independent, I like that. So they, they don't have a primary base, they self-select based on what they're trying to do. And with, of course, technology allows them to do that. So back in 2019, you know, this, 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 uh, uh, this title, this, this nomenclature was sort of new. It was seen as eccentric. It was not as mainstream as it is today. So there's been a, a pretty significant growth over the last five years just in the US around those who identify as, as digital nomads. And then really a lot of it is being led by uh, the younger generations in the workplace. Almost 60% of Gen X, or I'm sorry, millennials, Gen Y and Gen Z uh, identify as, as uh, nomads. My, my new favorite uh, title or name is Slomads. It's me, I'm a Slomad. So it's a digital nomad who changes locations at a much slower pace and so that's that's definitely something that I'm finding myself getting into. This was a interesting article that I found on Wall Street Journal that made me chuckle. They uh, they said the new workday dead zone and then their their clickbait title was why so many executives loathe hybrid working. And I was like, ooh yeah that's a that's a really good one. So what they said in the article was that they found workers in a, an assessment they were looking at, um, trying to understand how work was being done, found that there was a percentage of workers who were taking the 4 to 6 p.m. time frame to either get a jump start in, you know, picking up their kids, taking them to, uh, you know, to their soccer games, they were hitting that Peloton class, they were just trying to beat traffic home. 
And so, of course, the, you know, the executives were like, you can't make a decision at row one because everyone's gone, and so that's not but Microsoft started digging into this a little bit further, and they found that there was actually a triple peak in keyboard activity throughout the day. And so they found that there was a peak in the morning, one in the afternoon, and then funny enough, another one at 10 p.m. So these workers who were leaving early to do other things, getting back online later on, and continuing on to finish what they needed to do. So, so obviously, this is sort of the, the big aha of the day, if you didn't know. Uh, the most efficient meetings seem to be in the mornings, that's why we're here today, and not here on Friday at four. Uh, and, and so this typically seems to be where most, most of those meetings tend to occur are in, are in those meetings and not into the late afternoon hours. So, and this, this is also one that got me thinking. I was excited when I stumbled upon this. And it really got me thinking, is this the future of how spaces, buildings will be built in the future? Is this, is this the way that we will think about uh, creating and designing and, and, and supplying products to spaces to shrink and grow based on the need of how people use these spaces. So Hassel Studio worked with an Australian government entity to design a nine-story building to be able to flex and grow depending on the need. And so really what they did is they created their, all their consolidated all their special amenities uh, down near the ground floor. So their restaurants and print rooms and, and everything that is needed down near the ground floor, anything above that, those floors can be turned on and off depending on the need. In this scenario, there's a couple of elements that need to be in place. And so obviously you can't have all your important amenities spread out across the entire building or else you're not gonna be able to get access to them. So if you have that deadline that you have to print things for and it's closed off, that floor is closed, that's, that's not a good thing. The other, tidbit or the other asterisk here is that the employees, and in this instance were all agile or unassigned, they, they were mobile, they were adaptable, so uh, there was no assigned seating. So these groups would come in, check in for the day, and then would be told that your team is working on floor six today or this week, and they would then go and join their team. And then the other caveat here is that there needs to be some sort of reservation in, in place to understand who is coming in, how often, when, is next week, Tuesday going to be the peak day that we need to activate all the floors? Is Thursday going to be bring your dog to work day? So we'll have to make sure we shampoo all the carpets or whatever. But the idea is that having some sort of understanding of who's coming in when so that they can, they can change that out. So interesting enough, they're, they're, they're starting to look and see Will there be savings, building savings and, and maintenance and costs and are, is there a sustainable attribute to this? So kind of interesting to continue to watch this play out. So who's doing what? That's sort of the question. Well, that's, that's, that's the question. There's a lot of, of things that are happening and it really boils down to three elements. And so a lot of, of what we're hearing and seeing in the media from those companies who are making those strong mandates who really have this office first mentality or, or stance to say we are an office first organization. We want you in the office for five days, you know, 18 days a week, whatever, in, in the office. And so there's that sort of that piece to it. But then as you can see, there's a whole host of companies in this hybrid space that are all trying to understand what that distributed work piece looks like, what works, what doesn't work. And then there's some who've actually taken a perspective of saying, you know what, we are maybe now going to be a remote first organization and we maybe don't need as much real estate as perhaps we thought we needed before or maybe we will consolidate spaces or leverage co-working or whatever, but we're gonna maybe take a step back from, from being uh, in office first organization. So kind of interesting to see who's doing what. You may have seen or heard about the, the Smuckers uh, strategy that they have come out with uh, recently. So um, 
basically, they have roughly, uh, this is making me incredibly hungry, I skipped breakfast. Um, they have roughly 1,300 employees that work for uh, Smuckers based out of Ohio. And they've asked their corporate workers to be on site a minimum of six days per month. And really what that comes down to is that with 22 core weeks is what they have said. We want everyone to be here during certain times and it's pushing their, their occupancy upwards to 70 to 80%. What's, what's the interesting point here is they've said, you can live anywhere you want as long as you pay for your own way to get back here for those core days and those core weeks. And for the most part, people have bought in and said, okay, it works. So different, different perspective, different uh, strategy that certainly not everyone can do or, or would be willing to do, but that was a different one that I hadn't seen or heard before. So here are some other strategies. Uh, we won't name names, you know, they who shall not be named. Um, but it's, uh, there is one company that I've been talking to for a number of years who are struggling with their whole return to the workplace. And they started out early on in the pandemic and were planning on becoming a digital first organization. And we're going to leverage technology and only come in to their hub locations when and if needed. And um, the, the individual who was leading that team uh, was reassigned that we found out just recently it was fired. <laughs> so that didn't work well. And so they've had about four individuals in place leading this initiative. And they went all the way from this idea of being digital first now to having a very strong mandate in place. And it's, it's not going over well, as you can imagine. Um, the, the office location mandate, this is another interesting one where I've heard of a couple of companies who have said, if you're within a, a certain mile radius of one of our primary office hubs, 25, 50 miles, then you need to spend X amount of days, four days in the office. So if it's 50 miles, there are people who are actually saying, okay, good, I'm going to move 51 miles away. <laughs> really? So uh, there's, there's that whole, <laughs> whole element to it. And then uh, the no attenda, no spenda, a lot, not a lot, there's some executives and leadership teams that I've spoke to who are concerned, who are nervous about making changes, about spending dollars to make upgrades when they don't know if people are actually going to come in, right? Why, why should I spend and make all this investment if people are gonna just continue working from home? So they're also not uh, doing a great job at communicating the why, which is also a big, big hurdle or, or a missed opportunity. Uh, and they're not talking to their employees to understand what needs do they have? What, what has changed for them? Why, why do they prefer to work from home? What, so there's a lot of questions that are not being answered or even not being asked for the most part. So different strategies, the, the key here is that there is not a playbook. There's not a, a magic ingredient or a magic recipe to make it all work. We're all trying to figure it out. And, and so that's, uh, that's kind of the more, more of the interesting, interesting element. What, uh, this is also kind of interesting, Zipia found that almost three quarters of companies in the US actually have some sort of hybrid work model in place. They're either have offered it and are keeping it uh, or are, are offering it and or have implemented it and are, are, are thinking about keeping it. And then there's some who have just said, you know what, we, we started with one, we're, we're backing away from it. And then there's others who just said, you know, we, we just never offered it and we most likely won't offer it. And then of those that have implemented a plan, you know, they, there's 70% who said they're gonna plan on, on investing in more IT technology to continue to enhance that virtual connectivity because that, that type of collaboration is not, not gonna go away anytime soon. You've got 64% who said they're going to continue to provide support and resources to help managers manage 
a remote workforce, a distributed workforce, and then 57% who, who, again, continue to plan to spend money on providing the right types of spaces to support that virtual connectivity. So it's out there, it's happening, it's not gonna go away, um, and it's here to stay. You know, So Curtin and Gensler, this is them. They wanted to understand where are people spending their time each week? What location? This is more locational. So as you can see, the majority here spent at a company's office followed by an individual's home and then other third places or, or other spaces outside of that. And they did that for the US and for Canada. So little differences there between uh, US and Canada, but for the most part, pretty similar. So again, you've got a majority who are really spending most of their time in two locations throughout the week. So the next big insight here, you know, again, I think the future is really about going to the office, not going to work, because work is happening anywhere and everywhere around us. And so uh, another Gensler piece here that I thought was interesting, they wanted to understand what are the reasons, what's driving you to go into the office. And this was from their global uh, global workplace survey. And so they, they divided it out by different regions. And so funny enough, the top five here for the US, the number one was to go in to focus on my work, which if you recall, back early on, during and even just after the pandemic, you know, that was the big reason why people wanted to work from home was so that I could focus because I can't stand Bob and all his stories of his 16 cats or whatever. So this idea, I need to work from home so I can focus, well, people are now saying they need to go to work and focus on work which is kind of interesting, followed by having access to technology and, and others, their team and so forth. Canada apparently is a much more friendlier country than we are. <laughs> they, they prefer you know, to focus, but also to socialize with colleagues. It doesn't even fall in the top five for the US. So the UK, very similar to Canada. And then Asia Pacific had a couple of interesting ones. They wanted opportunities for professional development and coaching and having access to, to decision makers and, and to their leaders. And so kind of interesting to, to understand the why people were going into the office. And then another Gensler piece that again, got me thinking differently. I liked the question and I liked what they were going uh, or what they were trying to extract from this, but how then they divided up the data really got me excited to think about how spaces are designed. So they asked this question, if your company or organization could provide your ideal work experience mix, and they offered the eight options on the, on the left-hand side, would you be willing to come into your office, your workplace more often? So what they found, 42%, said they'd come in one more day a week if there were more quiet work areas, so like what you would find at a library, which makes sense with some of their previous findings. 24% said they'd come back more often or full-time if there were more amenity-rich type spaces that you would find maybe at a boutique hotel. 17% said they'd come back one more day a month, which I'm like, why even bother at that point? I mean, it's just stay home. They'd come back if there were more informal spaces for connection and community, and then of course another 17% who prefer that corporate business-like work environment. So this was great, I was like, okay, that's interesting. They took this data then, and then divided it up by generation. And I was like, oh, that makes so much sense because generationally, there are different preferences with how and where work is done. There's preferences with communication, and preferences with with how uh, they, they all use technology. And so it got me really thinking differently about the design of spaces. And so they, they, they gave all eight options. I just boiled it down to five. Um, so here's Gen Z. This was their top five. And you can, you can, uh, you know, you can tell me this is, this is all wrong. I, I, you know, I'm curious what your thoughts are, but this is what Gen Z said their ideal office, office experiences would be ranked one to five. Here's Gen Y, really the same, just four and five swapped around. Gen X, again, very similar, just in a different order. And then baby boomers were like, you all are crazy. Um, 
he needed to get back to the office <laughs> ASAP. And so this was their ideal office experience. And so this, when I, when I was able to look at it side by side, I had the aha to say, you know, a lot of the decisions that are being made that are impacting the workplace are being done on the right hand side of this chart that will impact the majority who are on the left hand side of the chart. So there may be a disconnect of are we putting in the right amenities, are we designing and creating the right types of spaces for our demographics or not. So this one uh, this one was really it really got me thinking differently. So I was kind of I nerd out on this stuff. This is, this is my my bread and butter. Uh, Cushman and Wakefield did something interesting where they started to look at, so amenities are important. They certainly can help bring people back into the workplace, really because you're trying to you're, you're trying to create a, a destination, a, a why should I come back and, and spend more time in the workplace. So it's not the only reason, but it, it's, it's certainly a strong component to help. But Cushman and Wakefield did a, a workplace survey to understand what are the top amenities that help bring people in that people are wanting to have uh, in the workplace. And they divided it up from an urban standpoint and from a suburban standpoint. So it's kind of interesting. So here are the top urban amenities that you can see here. And then they came back with the suburban. Kind of interesting to see the comparison. So obviously retail food services on site, really important. Uh, shower facilities in the urban, but not so much, so sorry. But kind of interesting to kind of see the comparison between where you are, where your workplace is located, what, what those preferences are for different amenity types. Three things that workers want now. Uh, JLL did a recent survey to understand what are people asking for because they have so much choice. They have the ability to, to self-select and spend time in certain settings that best supports them. So the number one that came out of this, relaxation spaces at 45%. Spaces that people can unplug, spaces that people can take a break and, uh, and, and restore their cognitive thinking, right? So that was, that was number one. A, a close second was healthy food services. It was really important. Hel having, offering healthier food options at work was really, really important. The third, outdoor spaces, came in third as, as being an extremely important amenity that employees want to have in the workplace, which is kind of also interesting. So next up, so at Hayworth, we continue to do some additional research. Uh, we have a, an interesting tool called the Business Fingerprint. Um, I laugh, a coworker once called it the, um, the Business Footprint. And I was like, no, that's something different. That's what we, you know, that's, yeah, that's, well, that's a whole other story. But this is the business fingerprint. Helps to identify and map out your top business objectives or priorities on how to successfully manage and meet your, your, uh, your initiatives that you're planning on. And so there's 18 different topics, 18 different elements to choose from. And we track the top five or 10 each year to understand sort of what's, what's important to different organizations. And so 2020, obviously we had very limited data. So like three months, it was virtually nothing. So we kind of skipped that. But you can see the differences in the top five each year. I'm really shocked that culture and well-being fell off of it in 22 when it was so strong in 21. And so we'll see in 2023, hopefully in the month, we'll be able to start looking at the new data to see what the new top five. Flexibility and adaptability, not going anywhere. Locked in at number three. So really for last year, it was people in space are the top priorities for most organizations when it comes to making workplace strategy decisions uh, for, their, for their companies. I think it's interesting that culture for a while. Yes. Yeah, you would think, you know, culture is is more important than ever. And we'll talk about culture here in just a sec. But yeah, it, it was so surprising how strong it was to be able to, I, I think it's like 10, 
it just didn't make the top five. But really be from number one to not in the top five, it was same with well-being. I mean, that was such an important element, certainly at that time. And for it to just simply fall off, again, that top five was, was really kind of happy. Just for it might be because the fact that you're trying to retain came a priority. So when you're trying to fill a void and immediately your culture Yep. And same with, with base utilization, right? Right. How do you how do you make sure that you're you're utilizing your your real estate footprint appropriately? And so yeah, these two almost could be number one because they are such a strong component to uh, that all all organizations are, are considering or talking about or, or trying to plan for. So being surveyed as a specific, is it for sort of top leadership or general organizational? All the above. Okay. Yep. Yep. So we offer this as it's like an exercise that we can walk through. So it can either be with um, a leadership team, it can be with a project team. Most times it's with an organization that's about to kick off or deploy some sort of new initiative. Right? We're building a new space, we're moving, we're consolidating, we're doing something that's impacting the physical environment. How do we want to measure success? Right? What are those things that we have to have in place for this initiative to be successful? Right. So these are their their metrics of, of success. Oh, I think of these as like guardrails. Like what are the things that are going to keep us safe? This is what we've chosen. So there's another question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We also this spring released some early data. Uh, that uh, we were trying to also understand what hybrid strategies were being deployed, what, what was working, what wasn't working. One of the more interesting questions was asking, you know, what, what elements of your current workspace are working well and certainly what elements are not working so well. So here's a quick dashboard of, of just that and so I'll even make it easier to read. So virtual collaboration technology, it, it's, it's working, right? It, it, it's helping us to stay connected. I think about if, if the pandemic had happened 10 or 15 plus years ago, we may have been severely challenged to continue doing what we did do without having you know, the ability to connect virtually as, as easily as we did. And then, so virtual collaboration technology working very well. Acoustics, Still an opportunity. It was an issue before, still an issue now. Major issue. This is, again, one of the reasons there's, uh, you know, people are coming to work to, to focus, but then there's also that acoustics network. So, boy, we've got we've to work together to figure out how to make, make improvements. So whether it's with the building, the architecture, the space, products, materiality, something, has to be has to be done to improve acoustics so kind of interesting to see that so the big question that we keep we keep getting asked is what's the future of the office look like and i say i have a freaking idea right stay tuned we'll find out together but we are looking at specific themes that we believe will be a part of the future and, and using this as a way to um, think about how products are designed, how spaces are designed, uh, what, is, what is important to, to consider and think about. So the first theme is around immersive technology. And so this is really creating, how do you create a seamless connection so that you ensure you have location or meeting equity, right? Because it's important to think about those that if, if everyone is not in person, you want to have the same experience online that you can have in person. And so maybe that that former uh, huddle space or, or uh, touchdown space is now your Zoom room or, or a virtual collaboration space at work. Or the space on the right, perhaps this is uh, an, an open team space that you want to make sure you've got the right technology in place so that people can see, can hear, and you've got hopefully you know good acoustics in place to be able to support the conversations. And so, making sure you've got the right pieces in place is going to be really important in the future. 
as is this other theme around more collaboration. It's not just going to be about virtual collaboration. It's going to be about in-person collaboration. So how do you create hubs for that to be more effective? And so perhaps the image on the left is looking at a space that a team can go in and close the doors and everything inside of that space is easily reconfigurable. So depending on the needs of that team, they can organize that space in a way that works best for them and still have access to digital technology, tackable and readable surfaces and everything that is needed to, to brainstorm and problem solve. Or perhaps you just need a space to work that may have partial barriers, right, to so block uh, uh, visual distractions in the workplace. And so allowing you to connect and work in a way and still be effective at collaborating. So a couple of ideas there. This, this idea around focus to restore. Throughout the day, we, we, uh, we, call, we, we do what's called uh, mode switching. We, we go from what's considered convergent thinking is what we do when we're doing heads down concentrative focus work. And we're using the prefrontal cortex and we're researching and studying and, and, and it, it takes deliberate action to, to do this, to, to do this focus work. And then we go into what's called divergent, which is what we do when we're at rest, when we're taking a break, when we're going for a walk. And this is where we're using other parts of the brain and this is where the creative rhythm in our brain all of a sudden connects, connects ideas and we have what's called a flash of insight, the aha, the idea, the light bulb moment. And so having the ability to switch modes from convergent to divergent is really important. And so having the right types of spaces to do that, so whether it's going into a space that you can control the acoustics, control your orientation, control 